as I've been stressing in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this unit, um, just the end of the Republic is just a busy time. There's a lot of events, a lot of different kind of uh, individuals to uh, kind of learn about and dates and so on. It's just a really complicated period just because of all the events that are happening. So I have uh, tried to streamline things um, and made them as clear as possible. Um, I hope as um, you've picked up on uh, in the um, material for the unit. But what I wanted to do here is just do a little slideshow that kind of fleshes out uh, the details on three of the most important individuals at this particular point in the unit. Uh, and that is Caesar, um, Pompey, and Crassus. Um, one of the things I, I find really fascinating, I'm a bit of a specialist in the, in the late Republic um, and the early empire. That's my main uh, area of interest, especially literature. But what I find really interesting about this period is, you know, we've been looking at the early Republic and, and the monarchy and so forth. And, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, back then, I mean, even reality or what happened, we're a little bit unclear of because we don't have any written text. We don't have any, um, you know, our, our, we depend on archaeology and so forth. But when we get to the first century and a little bit earlier, then what happens is we actually really get a sense of some of these people and what they were like, uh, not only visually, because now, as you can see here, we have busts and all sorts of statues and so forth, but a lot of people that were writing, because writing becomes, and histories become more common in the late Republic, we have a lot of information about these people. So we get a real insight into uh, what they were like and say how they conducted themselves. So really, personally for me, I find it very fascinating. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I want to just talk about these three individuals uh, just because they're so uh, important. Now, as I've uh, said in the con in the in the unit, right in the content of the unit, uh, Sulla uh, dies in seventy nine after kind of implementing a new sort of constitution, if you will. And in his absence, what we see are three men that really kind of come to the forefront of Roman politics. And those three men are uh, Gnaeus Pompeius, Marcus Licinius Crassus, and Gaius Julius Caesar. Uh, now, what I've done here is uh, the underlined port part you can see on the slide. That's how usually the names that we use um, to identify these individuals. Uh, I understand that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, uh, with Romans, with their three kind of different names, it could be confusing. So in terms of when you're studying and trying to remember things, just go by what I've underlined here, Pompey, Crassus, and Caesar, and that's fine, okay? So I just want to kind of flesh out some of the details that your textbook talks about with these three guys, uh, just to kind of set the stage um, for the unfolding of the Republic in the subsequent history, okay? So I'll go through each of them in turn. Uh, this is the first one, his name, uh, this is Pompey. And you can see here's two different busts, uh, but <clears throat> they do look remarkably similar in a sense, the shading here or whatever, the um, shadows are a bit confusing, but you can see that it looks like the same person, right? And also there's a distinctive hairstyle. Uh, this is supposed to remind you of Alexander the Great. It's kind of a visual illusion. I'll get back to that in a second. Uh, but Poppy uh, really is a huge figure in uh, late Republican history and just an extremely, um, capable guy. That's one of the best ways I could describe him. Not necessarily a nice guy, but very capable. Okay. So as I said, just a little bit about each of these guys. I can't go into great, great detail, but for Pompey, you can see he lives from uh, 106 BC to about 40, uh, 248. And he served under Sulla, right? So he's often referred to as what's known as a Sullen. That is, he not only did he serve under Sulla, but he was a kind of a supporter of his uh, maybe his approach and his philosophy and his politics. Now what happened is, <clears throat> excuse me, remember when Sulla returns to Rome after a uh, war in the East and he has to kind of reestablish his power and it's a bloody time in Rome because a lot of people are prescribed. So opposition to Sulla has to be kind of um, gotten rid of. Right? And here, Pompey really starts to, uh, just by his talents, he's really good at uh, kind of rounding up and eliminating the opposition to Sulla so that Sulla can uh, kind of impose his constitution. And this is where he earns the nickname Magnus, which is just the Latin word for great. So he's Pompeius Magnus, uh, Pompey the Great. Now, the idea here is that, of course, this is a reference to Alexander the Great. Uh, and the idea, remember, with Alexander is that he achieved so much at such a young age. Oh, this is the kind of 
reason that Pompey was given this name because he accomplished all these things at such a young age. Uh, don't let that fool you. He, uh, in order to achieve these things, he was quite brutal to put down some of these uh, this opposition. This is why you can see here another nickname that he was given was the Adulus Gentilus Carnifex, which basically translates as the teenage butcher, right? Uh, Roman politics could be ruthless, right? Prescriptionless, you kind of put your enemies to death, and Pompey uh, excelled in this, okay? Uh, so what I'm trying to explain here is how maybe how he comes to his position of prominence, right? Uh, later then you can see, so if this is, uh, we're talking 79 at the end of Sulla, uh, you can see that he becomes a consul with Crassus, so they're co-consuls in 70 BC. Now what's interesting here is that at this time, Pompey was still young, he's only 35 years of age. And if you remember um, from your readings, right, and I think I even mentioned this on one of the slideshows, is that in order to follow the cursus honorum properly, you weren't really supposed to reach the consulship until you were in your 40s. So in a sense, it's going against uh, tradition and precedent, but that just goes to show you how in the turbulent politics of the late Republic, precedent was you know, often thrown out if it, if it needed to be, okay? So he's, you know, that's the, the height, of course, of a, a political career is re reaching the consulship. So he's done that by 35 uh, years of age. So in seven, he's already a big player and people kind of respect him and so on. Where his um, kind of fame, reputation, and so forth really increase is in 67. What happens is there is a tremendous problem with piracy in the Mediterranean. Okay, uh, now remember, there's no Coast Guard, there's no police force in the ancient world. So pirates, if you will, and you don't really think about them with, you know, like uh, pirate, with parrots on their shoulder and all that kind of stuff. They just used to interrupt uh, trading lanes, steal stuff, kidnap people. Uh, and it was a real problem. And as I say, we've been talking about the economic expansion of Rome. So this really interfered with that. So it needed to be, it was a problem that had to be taken care of. And of course, a lot of the equestrians were complaining because their business interests were being upset. It was a huge problem if you're talking about uh, tackling piracy within the Mediterranean. So the Romans turned to Pompey because he seemed to be so capable and they gave him a huge amount of resources and powers to take care of this um, problem with piracy. Now, the thinking in Rome was that it might take two or three years to solve this, but Pompey managed to take care of the whole problem in a matter of months. Now, when he does that, people are really, really impressed, okay? Because that's like, oh, wow, he, he got rid of one of the biggest problems around and he did it so quickly. So that just elevates him in Roman's eyes. So much so that you can see here, the next thing that he's famous for is that Roman, he's, he's sent... Uh, to the east as a general with armies to conquer or to reestablish order in the east. And there he conquers places like Syria, Judea, uh, and elsewhere in some eastern kingdoms. Uh, so this is a really remarkable feat too, because what he does is he, he expands and kind of reorders uh, the whole eastern part of um, the Roman Empire and expands it. So it's just kind of, uh, this is, was really impressive in, in Roman eyes too, the idea that whenever you expand the empire in Rome, it was going to come across really well. All right, so he does this. So you can see there, he comes back to Rome in about 62 after conquering the east and then after beating the pirates, being consul 35 years of age. He really, at this time, at around kind of the late 60s, was the most kind of powerful, uh, prominent, and influential Roman. He really was, okay? So that kind of leads us up to uh, right around 60 BC, which is the kind of date then that we're going to pick up on after the slideshow is over. So that's Pompey. The next person here, this is Crassus, right? Uh, and again, you can see these are two different busts, but they're very similar. Uh, looks like a very kind of stern, old-fashioned Roman, in a sense, conservative. Um, now you can see uh, the dates of his life are 115 to 53. Uh, he too is a Sullen. That means he served under Sulla. He doesn't have quite the um, military uh, experience of someone like Pompey. Crass was always desperate to prove himself militarily speaking, uh, but never quite managed to do so. Crass is really most famous in Rome or most important because of his enormous wealth. Okay, He was just really the richest man in Rome. And in Rome, uh, money went a long way because me, people needed money to run campaigns, they needed it for a living or whatever. So he you know, lent out a lot of money uh, and therefore people owed him a lot of favors. So he had a lot of influence that way. Now, a lot of that wealth came after 
uh, sell a return to Rome and prescribe people. So a lot of that, his wealth was kind of ill-gotten, if you will. But as I said, he had that money and he could distribute it as he wished. So that was a powerful thing. People would turn to him. Uh, other things, though, that make his name in Rome. Um, I haven't talked about the revolt of Spartacus, but I'm sure you've heard of Spartacus, right? He's a gladiator who leads, who leads a slave revolt. Now, we've talked about the tens of thousands of slaves in Italy. They were a problem, right? Uh, because if they revolted, kind of rebelled against their own, they could be a real problem just because of the sheer number of them. And Spartacus and gladiators who were slaves, and I'm going to talk about gladiator uh, in if not the next unit, the unit after that. Well, they were especially difficult or problem uh, problematic because they had been trained to fight, right? So what happens is Spartacus leads this revolt that kind of gets out of hand. As you can see, they have this kind of roving band of um, kind of slaves and escaped gladiators and so forth that kind of want freedom, hopefully kind of escape from Italy. But they're roaming around the Italian countryside. It's a real problem, uh, you know, Romans are being killed, and they're being killed, and so on. Uh, so Crassus really helps stamp this out. He really does kind of take the leading role. The only problem is that at one point, especially near the end, it was getting so bad that Pompey was recalled just to kind of help out. So Pompey kind of uh, arrives at the last minute, and uh, unfortunately for Crassus, gets a lot of the credit for putting down the revolt of Spartacus, but Crassus did kind of acquit himself well there. And that's why, as you can see, in the subsequent year, he and Pompey were made co-consuls. So he does have some of that kind of, uh, he should kind of demonstrated some abilities on the battlefield, but it's really the money. That's where Crassus um, gains his uh, power. Third person, Caesar, right? Now Caesar is like Pericles or Alexander the Great or like Augustus, as we're going to see next. Just one of these huge figures of, of course, of ancient history in Rome. All right, everybody knows about him and all the things he accomplished and so on. So just a huge figure. Now, of course, we have an incredible number of busts of Caesar, and they all look re remarkably similar, especially the one on the left. That when you see so many portraits of him, this is what they're very, very similar to this. The one on the right, although you can see some some similarities. Uh, this is from Egypt, and it's in a very hard stone that's difficult to work with, but you can see how it. Um, looks. I have a description of Caesar in a second uh, in which um, if you kind of compare um, the passage with what you see here, you'll see the similarities. Now Caesar, of course, uh, dies in 44, uh, but he's born in 100. So you can see Caesar, uh, Pompey Crassus, they're all very mm, roughly around the same age. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the slideshow, uh, one of the things that's interesting about this period is that we just know more about these figures. I mean, I've been showing you busts, so you actually know what they look like. I mean, we don't know what some of their monarchs look like, right? And of course, we also have biographies. You know, I've referred to, this is from Suetonius. I've mentioned him before. He's a biographer who's writing in Rome in the first century AD, and he kind of takes a look at uh, emperors and famous Romans and writes biographies of them. But what he likes to do is give you a little um, physical description so that you can kind of envision what he looks like. So this is what Suetonius said about Caesar, right? It is said that he was, meaning Caesar, tall, of a fair complexion, round limb, rather full face, with eyes black and piercing. People always seem to mention that about his eyes. And that he enjoyed excellent health, except towards the close of, a close of his life, when he was subject to sudden fainting fits and disturbance uh, in his sleep. He was likewise twice seized with a falling sickness while engaged in active service. People have suspected that maybe he had epilepsy, we're not too sure. He was so nice, meaning very careful, if you will, in the care of his person, that he not only kept the hair of his head closely cut and had his face smoothly shaved, but even caused the hair on other parts of the body to be plucked out by their roots, a practice for which some persons rallied against, uh, rallied him. I think that should be railed. But anyways, so he was very careful in his appearance. Uh, his baldness uh, gave him much uneasiness, having often found himself on that account exposed to the jibes of his enemies. He therefore used to bring forward the hair from the crown of his head. In other words, because his hair was receding, he pushed his hair forward. That's today what we call a Caesar haircut. And of all the honors conferred upon him by the Senate and the people, there was none which he either accepted or used with greater pleasure than the right of wearing constantly a laurel crown. I'm sure you've seen Romans with those, so he could put it on the top of his head and it was hide his bald spot. 
It is said that he was particular in his dress, for he used uh, the latus clavus, which is a type of toga, with fringes about the wrists, and always had it girded, meaning kind of tied, about him rather loosely. This circumstance gave origin to the expression of Sulla, who often advised the nobles to beware of the ill-girt boy. So even Sulla, early on when he was still alive, realized that there was something about Caesar and you should keep an eye on this guy. Right, so that helps to kind of give you a little bit of uh, insight into perhaps what he looked like. Now, unlike Pompey and uh, Crassus, uh, Caesar is known, uh, he served under Marius, so he's often referred to as a Marian. All right, now, Sullen versus uh, kind of Marian. Remember that uh, these terms that are used in your textbook, the optimates and the populares. Now, these aren't political parties, but they're kind of represent um, political views to some extent. I just don't want to make you think the parties. Uh, but generally speaking, the optimates would be more in favor of, say, the aristocracy, the upper classes, whereas the populares made more appeals to some of these classes and groups that had traditionally been excluded or kind of underserved, so the kind of urban poor, the rural poor, and stuff like that. And that's where Caesar actually got a lot of his support. He was very popular with the common person. We do know, this is kind of just a funny story, but it kind of gives you insight into what kind of person Caesar uh, was like. Uh, when he was returning to Rome, he was chased out of Rome by Sulla, when Sulla returned, uh, because he was a supporter of Marius, right? Now, when he eventually did come back, and was kind of making his way back by sea, because he fled over to, I think, to Greece in the east, on his way back, he was actually kidnapped by pirates, those same pirates that we were talking about earlier. And they kidnapped him and held him for ransom. I said, this could happen. Uh, and the story goes, and I'm gonna, there's an account of it, this is from Plutarch. Anyways, these pirates grabbed hold of him, and then said, okay, you owe us a ransom. So, you know, contact whoever and get the money. Uh, and then when Caesar found out how much they were asking for him, he said, oh, you know what? I'm a pretty important person. You should really ask for more, right? So the pirates kind of laughed at that. But he also told them like, listen, no matter you know what you do, uh, if you pay this ransom, whatever, just be aware that I am going to get my vengeance upon you. And they just kind of laughed it off or whatever. So that's the context of this story given by, uh, provided by Plutarch, a later writer. And it says here, the, the pirates were delighted at this, meaning his uh, suggestion that should, they should ask for more money as a ransom. And so the pirates were delighted at this and attributed his boldness of speech to a certain simplicity and boyish mirth. But after his ran ransom had come from Miletus, that's a city in Asia Minor, remember, because we're in the East, and had paid it and was set free, he immediately... So now he's free. He immediately manned vessels and put to sea from the harbor of Miletus, which is in Asia Minor, against the robbers. In other words, as soon as he's free, boom, he goes to hunt them down. He caught them too, still lying at anchor off the island, and got most of them into his power. So he did exactly what he said. He's going to capture them. Their money he made his booty, meaning his own kind of personal plunder. But the men themselves he lodged in prison at Pergamum again in Asia Minor. Then he went in person to Junius, the governor of Asia, right, for some justice, on the ground that it belonged to him as praetor of the province to punish these captives. But since the praetor cast long eyes on their money, which was no small sum, and kept saying that he would consider the case of the captives at his leisure, Caesar left him to uh, his own devices, went to Pergamum, took the robbers out of prison, and crucified them all, just as he had often warned them on the island that he would do when they thought he was joking. So he told them, not I'm going to gain vengeance on you, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to crucify you. This is what he told them before he was released, and they kind of laughed at all. Crucifixion was the worst penalty uh, in uh, in kind of Roman punishment system. Uh, but here he did exactly. It's just this kind of story that just seems so much like Caesar, that he kind of went down, hunted them out, and then crucified them all. Although the story also circulates that he did have their throats cut before they were crucified, uh, as a gesture of goodwill in a sense, so they wouldn't undergo this long, torturous punishment on the crucifix. Rather, they were killed quickly. Caesar was very famous. I mean, this sounds bad, bad to say, but Caesar is very, very famous for his uh, leniency and his clemency for forgiving people. And we'll see that in the Civil War. Uh, pirates are different, right? Because they're not Romans, but he cut them a bit of a break. But I always find that story about Caesar fascinating. Um, 
Now, when he does return to, uh, to Rome, you can see that he does work as, you know, has a typical career. He's from a prominent family, has a typical career, works his way up the Cursus Sonorum, right? Serving as quaestor and edile. And then he becomes, you can see, um, he does reach the consulship, of course, we know that. Uh, but in 63, he's named uh, Pontifex Maximus, which is like the chief priest in Rome. So that too, that's a, you know, at 63, if you're Pontifex uh, Maximus, man, he's one of the leading Romans at that time. He did serve in Spain and elsewhere, so lots of military experience. Uh, and really, as a military leader, uh, he really is kind of unmatched um, in Rome at this time. I mean, he does win the Civil Wars, as we'll see. Uh, and he conquers all of Gaul. Uh, so militarily speaking, I don't think Caesar ever lost a battle. I'm just trying to think. But anyways, just, I mean, just defeats everybody. And with a lot of ingenuity, he really is a remarkable uh, military mind. But I don't want to think of you to think of Caesar just as uh, a military commander or a politician. Like so many of Romans, these upper-class Romans, they had a lot of kind of interest. And the idea of being a good Roman or kind of a good man, if you will, um, involved many things. It meant political service, it meant military service, but also kind of uh, intellectual pursuits. And I think for a lot of people that, you know, they think of Julius Caesar being kind of killed and they have really not a huge idea of kind of who he was, they're maybe sometimes um, surprised to learn of how much writing he did and it's still available. His two main works are the Gallic Wars, right, which detail his conquest of Gaul, so you know, killing all sorts of Gauls, all sorts of his expedition to Britain, all sorts of things. So it just accounts for the, um, his uh, affairs in Gaul. And what would happen is he'd send these reports back to Rome, and of course, because he was expanding the empire, defeating all these Gauls, it was seen as, you know, it was great PR for him. He also wrote one in the Civil War. Right, we're not at that point yet, but another one too. But he also was very famous for his works on grammar and rhetoric. He wrote a very famous work on grammar. Unfortunately, he doesn't survive. Um, but he was very um, devoted to, I say, or very much a student of rhetoric and grammar and the use of language. And he does have a very distinctive style. So when you read the Gallic Wars and the Civil War, especially in Latin, they're just, they have a very, very, I love the style. It's called the plain style or the attic style. Uh, it's very, very good. And I just, it appeals to me a lot, but I think, and I'm not just putting this in here as a kind of personal plug, but even famous Roman orators like Cicero and others, when they look to the prose of, that's a writing of Caesar, they too recognize just how good it was. So very, very accomplished guy in that, you know, very uh, kind of well-rounded in a sense, um, although he was a bit of a tyrant, of course. Uh, but the reason I include this is to say just to flesh out this whole idea of Caesar. Now, hopefully, um, this was meant just to introduce you to these three characters, these three individuals. So hope that kind of, I mean, helps out with the complexity of this whole period of history and kind of explain things a little more. Now what happens is when you pick up in the in the content um, in the unit online, uh, this is where we're going to pick up just around uh, the year 60. Okay, so hopefully this has been of some use for you.